Good to see everybody this beautiful Sunday morning. It is beautiful. Welcome to all of you who are joining us online. We're glad to have you. And if you're watching this later on YouTube, we're glad to have you too. We have quite a few of our friends who pick this up during the week on YouTube. Well, I'm going to put in another pitch for our new ministry. Uh, several of you have uh, done the correct thing and gotten involved in this. For the rest of you, come on. The water's fine. We'd love to have you. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, we'll just come and ask me. But it's something that everybody can do, and uh, hopefully uh, everybody will. We'd love to have a, a complete network where every member of Southeast has got somebody, and I know you have many people, I understand that, but somebody from Southeast who has specifically got you on their mind, and that would be a wonderful thing. And of course, many of you are going to be the recipient as well as the provider, so it, goes, it both goes in both directions. All right, well, before we get back into the uh, Sermon on the Mount, I've got a couple of little things to share with you. As you know, I'm, I'm always interested in, in uh, the status of the Christian movement uh, locally and internationally. And uh, I got to wondering about what, what, are, what, what is the largest congregation of Christians in the world. So I did a little research on it, and uh, it's pretty amazing, really. Um, the largest single congregation uh, in the world is in South Korea. Uh, Yoido Full Gospel Church there. Um, they don't know exactly how many members they've got, and this is, uh, you know, depending on which site you look at, you can come up with quite a bit different numbers on it, but up to at least uh, uh, 800,000 people in one congregation. That's a little bit bigger than Southeast. <laughs> um, they uh, had, have a, a relatively small uh, gathering auditorium. Uh, I think it's, I don't know, somewhere around maybe 15,000, 16,000 capacity. They have, I don't know, six, eight, ten services every, every Sunday. And then they have satellite churches, and then they have home churches all over Korea. And there, there are other large gatherings of uh, Christians in South Korea. And there are uh, a handful of, of small churches of Christ. I've been to uh, a couple of them. We have a, a really good school there. I've taught at that school in South Korea. I spent, uh, Donna and I spent a month there one year. Wonderful, wonderful school, wonderful people. I love the Korean people, hate the Korean food, absolutely hate it. But the people I love to death. Um, second largest is a Calvary Temple in India. Um, somewhere around 350,000 people. And there again, they've got an auditorium that seats maybe, uh, maybe 18,000, another auditorium that seats about 15,000 there on the same campus. Uh, and then some smaller auditoriums, and they actually have simultaneous services in about five different languages. They, they, they have buildings where they have English services, and Japanese services, and Indonesian services, um, and a couple of others, uh, at the same time that, that they're meeting. Uh, and they actually begin at 6.30 in the morning on Sunday, and then they run all through, all through the day. But their services are like two hours apiece, two hours each. They got to be known quite well internationally during the COVID 
crisis because they took one of their large buildings and uh, converted it into a, a, a temporary uh, hospital of sorts, set up tons of cots. They were dealing with hundreds of COVID patients there in their facility uh, during that crisis. Got all kind of outreach programs and international programs. Uh, the, the third largest is in uh, Lagos, Lagos, Nigeria, uh, something like 250,000. And there's a couple of other large congregations in uh, Nigeria. You probably know Nigeria, the northern half of Nigeria is almost entirely uh, uh, Muslim. The southern half is predominantly, right now at least, Christian. There's a mix there, but, but predominantly Christian. Um, that, that going back to number two, that Calvary Temple, that it, it, India is just an enigma to me. Um, I shared with you a week or two ago about my friend who was recently over in India, and and, and he met with the uh, Christians in a, the area in which he was visiting, uh, and and the, and there in that area of India is completely underground. There, you would not find anything like this in that area. Uh, it's heavily persecuted if you're a Christian. But it's not the Hindus that are doing it. It's the politicians. If you know anything about the Hindu religion, uh, it is a, a religion of inclusion. They, are, they, they welcome... They're, 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 they don't have any intention or desire to persecute any other religious... Uh, organization. So it's kind of strange that here you would have uh, the second largest congregation meeting openly. Incidentally, that Calvary Temple, I saw the plans that they have drawn up on the internet for an, a, a building, a domed building that will hold 250,000 people. That's their, that's their next big project. And then uh, the number four is the uh, Bethany Church of God in Indonesia uh, with uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 200,000. Incidentally, again, the, the Calvary Temple in, in India has one auditorium that seats 3,000 people and it's designated for first-time visitors every Sunday. <laughs> That's just kind of mind-boggling. <laughs> So what's, what's consistent with these, with these four uh, congregations? They are all what we broadly can, can term charismatic. They are all very spirit-led, spirit-filled. They believe the Holy Spirit is alive and well and active in the church and in the people. And uh, that, I think, is, is one of the, the, the real con contributing factors to their uh, immense success. And we talked about the, the Pentecostal movement before and, and the, the way that it's growing. And even though uh, none of these except the number, that first one is associated directly with any denomination, as it were, um, they all have that in common. They are all very spirit-led, spirit-filled, uh, charismatic congregations. Well, I've been thinking about something. And uh, I'm going to get on my soapbox for just a little while, and then we'll get back to the Sermon on the Mount. Um, Walter Scott is one of, of four guys... Uh, who were the kind of the, the core group that organized and got off the ground the idea of this Church of Christ, Christian, what we call restoration movement um, back in the uh, late uh, 18th and early 19th centuries. He, along with uh, Thomas and Alexander Camel, 
and Barton Stone were the main movers and shakers. Well, Walter Scott was uh, teaching a, a class of kids, children, and you've heard this story before. And it was back in the days before we had the internet and uh, projectors and uh, where he was, he didn't have a chalkboard and he didn't have his flannel gram. But he wanted to have a visual aid. So he wanted to teach them the plan of salvation, right? So he had five fingers. <clears throat> so how many steps are there in the plan of salvation? One for every finger on Walter Scott's hand. If he had had six fingers, it would have been a six-step plan. <laughs> You've heard this, I'm sure, all your life, you know. The plan of salvation is you have to hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. How many of you heard of that? Yeah. Well, I grew up with it. I taught it, preached it, lived it, learned it, loved it. Um, and it's pretty good uh, insofar as it goes. So number one, hear. Uh, duh. I mean, you know... <laughs> Yeah, if you don't know, if you haven't heard, if you haven't been told, if you haven't read, if you haven't learned. Uh, but for me, growing up, here meant go to church Sunday morning and listen to 45-minute sermon. Okay, but, chink, I clicked that one off. Believe. Well, what does believe mean to an 11-year-old kid who's getting ready to be baptized, which is what I was? Well, I guess believe means that I can intellectually accept that it makes sense to me that Jesus is divine, the Son of God. Well, that's important, isn't it? But that's a long way from faith. Faith and faithfulness is the result of that belief. It's what you do with that belief. It's what it means in your decision making. And the way you live your life. Number four is confess. That was easy. Because you walked down the aisle and you stood up and the preacher said, do you believe Jesus Christ the Son of God? And you said, yes. Cha-chink. Got that one checked. Okay, as far as it goes. But I think that as we mature, we understand that confession is a great deal more than that. Confession is the way that we interact with the people in our lives and the people we meet on a daily basis. We confess with our lives, we confess with our words, we confess with our actions and our decisions. It's not, a pro it's not, a, it's not an event it's a process. Baptism, of course, that's the easy one because you can put that one on the calendar, right? What day were you baptized? ka -chink. Got it. Our most recognizable scripture in our Church of Christ tradition is what? Acts 2.38. I can remember, and I've, I've probably mentioned this in class before, but I can remember back in, in the good old days, uh, which wasn't so long ago, when we would go to the big gatherings, uh, Tulsa Workshop or uh, uh, the lectureships at some of the colleges or, or whatever it was, where there would be several thousand people gathered together. And as you got closer to the event, physically I'm talking about, as, you're, as you were driving down the highway and you got closer to the city where the event was going to happen, You'd look around and somebody had a sign up in their window that said Acts 238. And you'd look over and say, yeah, 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 me too, me too. We knew that was Church of Christ. We own that chapter, that verse. And that verse says what? What's the first thing? Huh? Repent. Repent. Be baptized. 
receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Well, we weren't sure about that Holy Spirit part of it. So we rationalized that to mean the, Holy, the gift of the Holy Spirit is going to be heaven when we die. I don't know how we ever got to that point, David. But we got there. And we loved it. I've been thinking a lot about repentance. That's one you can't put on the calendar, isn't it? What does it mean to an 11-year-old kid to repent? What does it mean to repent? Well, I think what we were taught, if I remember it correctly, is you feel sorry about the things you've done wrong. That's repentance. I hadn't done a lot of things wrong in my first 11 years growing up in a very strict Church of Christ family, attending services three times a week and going to two week-long revivals. I wasn't perfect. I didn't have a lot to be sorry for. But I tried to be sorry as best I could. It's kind of like the prayer, you know, if I have done anything wrong, please forgive me. That kind of thing. <laughs> I got to look into that word, metanoia, and it means a whole lot more than that. And this is really... I think at the very heart and core of what it means to be a citizen in the kingdom of God. And unfortunately, it's not something that you can write on the calendar and say, cha-chink, I did that. It's like faith and confession. It's a process. And, and its deepest meaning it means to change your paradigm. You know what a paradigm is, right? A paradigm is the way you look at life. It's the, it's the basis on which you make your decisions and your judgments. Some people have a paradigm that is so negative and so um, downbeat that they're just unpleasant to be around, right? Some people have a paradigm that is just... Uh, uh, you know, so rosy and, and so uh, idealistically perfect that, that you, kind of, <laughs> you kind of say, really? But it's, a way we, it's, it's the color of the glass, the lens that we look through. The rose colored or the, the dark gray colored or whatever. It's how we look at things. And Jesus said, when you come into my kingdom, you put on my glasses. And you start looking at the world through my glasses, through my eyes. It's a paradigm shift. And that's why we need to be studying the life of Christ. How did Christ look at things? It's the way we think, the way we look at life. Paul describes it with the word metamorphosis in Romans 12, verse 2. Don't be conformed to this world, but what? Transformed changed go from a caterpillar to a butterfly Jesus kind of described it to Nicodemus in John 3 to be born again a new birth that's what repentance is all about so it was much simpler when I was 11 years old and all I had to do was be sorry for something I might or might not have done but as we think of it in, in this terms, it's, it's not what we are, it's what we're becoming. And in all of these things, the confession and the faith is a journey. And it should take us closer today than we were yesterday in being the image bearers of our Lord. That's our task. That's our job. That's our commission. To be image bearers of Jesus Christ. We haven't arrived. Paul said, I haven't arrived. I'm pressing onward. I'm striving. I'm reaching for that goal. For the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And as we think about these things that we're talking about in the Sermon on the Mount, and we'll be looking at some more this morning, it's the same sort of thing. Jesus is holding up the ideal. 
And our job is to progress in that direction. We may never get there, probably won't. Not in this life anyway, but that's the goal. So back to the Sermon on the Mount. Thank you for bearing with me on my uh, soapbox today, but every once in a while I have to come back and revisit that just for my, my own benefit. We're talking about what it means to surpass or exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees. And we've talked about uh, murder and hatred. We've talked about uh, adultery and lust. Uh, we've talked about uh, divorce and remarriage. So today we're going to get to the other three. Again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but keep the oaths you have made to the Lord. And this is taken primarily from Leviticus 19, verse 12. But I tell you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. Well, you can if you go down to the store and buy some dye, but that's another story. Simply let your yes be yes and your no, no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. James goes a step further. He says... But most of all, my brothers and sisters, never take an oath by heaven or earth or anything else. Just say a simple yes or no so that you will not sin and be condemned. Pretty straightforward language, wouldn't you say? Pretty easy to understand. Don't take an oath. We talked some, <laughs> okay, so I'm not completely off my soapbox yet. I'm sorry. We talked some about bibliolatry, and, 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 and bibliolatry means the Bible says that I believe it, that settles it. Whatever the Bible says that I understand and I accept, that settles it. Um, in our tradition, the Church of Christ tradition, we have taught that, and I have preached and not too long ago, uh, after I've been here in the Southeast, I have taught that uh, Scripture becomes normative, that is, Scripture becomes a binding law, as expressed by command, example, necessary inference, and silence. You'll sometimes see it in literature as C-E-N-I, and then sometimes they'll add S-O-S, which is silence of Scripture. Uh, of course, silence of Scripture is a really neat tool because it can be permissive or prohibitive depending on how we want to use it. When it comes to instrumental, instrumental music, it's prohibitive. The silence makes it prohibited. When it comes to buildings and songbooks and, and pitch pipes, it's permissive because the Bible doesn't forbid it. So it's real handy. You can go either way, pretty much prove anything you want to prove. These statements that we're having this morning on oath, taking an oath, and on an eye for an eye, these cannot be read any way other than a direct command. They're not inference. They're not example. They're certainly not silent. They are a command. So why don't we do it? Or does it maybe make more sense to view them as principles, the ideal, rather than a pattern of law and command? There are groups, as you know, who do take the swearing, the oath giving, as a literal command, and they will not... Um, when they go into court, they will not swear to tell the truth. 
some of those are the, the friends, the Quakers, the Mennonites, the Amish, the Hutterites. There are probably others. Those are just happen to be the ones I know about. They take it very literally. And uh, so I think that if I'm right, and if we got lawyers, you can correct me. I think that the courts now have accommodated by saying, will you affirm? So it's okay if you affirm, as long as you don't bow. I don't know. Matthew 26 and verse 74, same word here. Peter began to curse and to swear. I don't know the man. He took an oath. I don't know the man. Well, that wasn't good. He should have listened to Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Acts 2 and 30. Brothers, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him what? God is swearing? God is taking an oath? That he would place one of his descendants on his throne? God frequently made oaths. What are covenants other than an oath? Matthew 26, but Jesus remained silent. Then the high priest said to him, I demand in the name of the living God, I want you to swear in the name of the living God, tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. And Jesus said, in essence, I swear. I bow. It reads a little differently in English, but that's what he said. You have said it. And in the future, you will see the Son of Man seated in the place of power at God's right hand and coming on the clouds of heaven. Paul was forever and a day making vows. He even made a Nazarite vow at one time. You see the difference in a command and a principle, right? Jesus is making a principle. He's talking about um, the way that the Jewish people, the Pharisees in particular, the rabbis, had played games with the law of Moses. You see, they, they, they took the law and they broke it into all these the best way to describe it is loopholes. So a vow referred to one thing, an oath referred to something else. Some vows were important, some vows were not important. They could have degrees of importance. There were rituals that could nullify a vow. You could get out of a vow if you wanted to by doing certain things. And then when you came to Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, they consider all vows to be nullified. So this is what Jesus is really getting at here is quit playing games with God. Just let your yes be yes. Let your no be no. And let that be true. That makes sense? You have heard that it was said, eye for eye and truth for tooth. And this is kind of from Leviticus 24. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes or slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. That's a command. Or is it a principle? Point to your right cheek for me. That one. Most of the people in the world are right-handed, right? Now I'm in the first century too. So if I'm going to strike you on the right hand, how am I going to do it? Backhand. Backhand. I don't know what that meant in the first century, but I know in the West, for most of our history, and in the medieval time, that was an insult, right? I challenge you to a duel. It wasn't, a, it wasn't an aggressive, uh, I'm going to beat you up thing. Now, I, I'm not making that as a statement about what Jesus had in mind, because I don't know what that first century custom was. But I do know that it, it, if you think about it, 
It's, it's a slap, not a punch. Nonetheless, if I come up and hit you, what's the command? Turn the other cheek. Now then that begs the question, what happens after you hit me on the other cheek? Yeah. Now I'm going to beat the snot out of you. If I'm big enough. If I'm big enough. Command or principle. If someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, let them have your cloak as well. Uh, the, the Matthew report has the implication of, of a suit, a lawyer, you know, a court situation. Uh, Luke doesn't do that. He just says if they take it. And it's not a court thing. It's just a physical thing. Someone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Uh, I just was curious, and I looked up the Roman mile. It was uh, um, a little bit longer than ours, not a whole lot. It was a 1,000 paces, basically, which came out to something like 5,821 feet. Uh, what, what's a mile? 5,200 and something, 5,200 and... Not that that means anything at all. But the idea behind this is that in, in those days, as I understand it, a Roman soldier who had a pack on his back and got tired of carrying his pack could grab a Jewish person and say, here, you carry it. And that was considered acceptable. And Jesus says, if that happens to you, don't resist it. Just go ahead and carry it an extra mile. When was the last time somebody asked you to carry their pack for you, for them? People do ask us, don't they? They have burdens that, that they need us to carry. It may not be physical. It may be emotional. I think the principle still holds. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Command or principle? If I, as a Christian, come up to you as a Christian and say, I need $1,000, I want you to loan it to me right now. The command is you do it. That might work once, probably not twice. Luke 6 and 30 says, give to anyone who asks and if one takes, takes what belongs to you. If they ask it, give it. If they don't ask it, but they just take it, that's okay too. Don't demand it back. Don't make any effort to try to get it back. Tom bought a new car yesterday, so it's sitting out there, and somebody comes along and says, ooh, that's pretty. I think I'll take that. So he gets in it and hot wires it and drives off, and Tom sees it and knows who it is. But the command is, let it go. Is that a command or is that a principle? I don't think we have trouble understanding that these are principles. So why can't we do the same thing with marriage and divorce? It's the same context. Same sermon. You've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. He causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good, sends a rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. The, the really good thing about this principle, the, the thing that makes it doable, is that love, as Jesus is describing it, is not a feeling. It's a choice. So I don't have to like you if you're my enemy to love you. And to love in the terms of the command of Jesus, the agape love is to act in their best interest. And that can be very, very difficult, can it? It can be very hard. And we don't always do a real good job of it. But the goal is to become better and better and better at it. 
to become more an image bearer of him who said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing as they nailed him to the cross. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? And not, are, not even the tax collector, are not even the tax collectors doing that? <laughs> I, wonder, I wonder what Matthew thought about that. <laughs> and if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that. And what he's saying is, is if you do these things that I'm outlining for you, if you turn the other cheek, if you let your yes be yes and your no be no, if you don't try to retaliate every time somebody does something wrong against you, then your righteousness is exceeding the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. You are living as a, as a child of the king in the kingdom of God, under the reign of God, and the Holy Spirit is empowering you day by day, little by little, to become more like our Lord. And then there's a, the real kicker, <clears throat> Matthew 5 and 37. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, how's that for a command? If we didn't get you before, we got you now. Got any perfect people in here? Got any perfect people in here? <laughs> and don't think so. Perfectly forgiven. Uh, one translation, the Young's literal translation says, you shall therefore or thereby maybe, be perfect, complete, as your Father who is in the heavens is perfect or is complete. Um, not that you are, but that you are in the process of becoming. You shall be. Which I think is an easier hill to climb than to... Uh, get up in the morning and say, okay, today I, I have to be perfect like God is perfect or I can't be in his favor. We're going to skip over now into the, the Gospel of Luke uh, for a minute and just kind of breeze through these the way that, that Luke uh, presented them. But to you who are willing to listen, I say, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who hurt you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, offer the other cheek also. If someone demands your coat, offer your shirt also. Give to anyone who asks, and when things are taken away from you, don't try to get them back. And then the verse that we all are very, very familiar with. Do to others as you would like them to do to you. We call that what? That's the golden rule, isn't it? Matthew will, Jesus will say it also in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7, do, do to others whatever you would like them to do to you. This is the essence of all that is taught in the law and the prophets. Golden rule. Remember when we, not too long ago, there was a big movement, and it still goes on a little bit, but it was a big thing for a while where you wore the bracelet that said WWJD. What would Jesus do? Not a bad, not a bad motto. Treat others the way you want to be treated. Of course, this presupposes that you have a high regard for yourself. There, there are exceptions to this, as we know. There are people in this world who don't like themselves, who mistreat themselves intentionally, who through mental illness do things to themselves 
that you wouldn't want done to you. So even here, this is not a hard, fast law. This is a principle. The Hindus say it this way, let no one do to another that which would be repugnant to himself. This is the sum of righteousness. The rest is according to inclination. Confucius says, do not do unto others what you would not want others to do to you. So in those religions, they have taken the golden rule and, and made a, a negative out of it instead of a positive. I like ours better. I like the proactive aspect of doing rather than having done to you. We're just about out of time. I was looking for a, a song for the golden rule, and there are not many out there, and the one I found did not make the top 10 on any list that I'm aware of, but it's a fun little song. <laughs> oh, I, I got one more slide before we get to it. I hope we got time to get through the song. This is a Norman Rockwell painting gifted to the United Nations by the USA, uh, presented by Nancy Reagan in October 21st, 8, 1985. I don't, you probably can't read it, but it's got the golden rule there in front of that picture of all of the different cultures of the world. I thought it was a beautiful thing. Lloyd's going to be singing that the rest of the day. <laughs> All right, well, Lord willing, next week we're going to be getting into uh, the uh, prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. So if you haven't got that memorized yet, you might want to go memorize the Lord's Prayer. And um, we'll see what we can do to uh, unpack that. Thank you for being here, for your attention, and uh, have a wonderful, God-blessed week. Thank you, lady.